We meet in an hour of change and challenge, in a decade of hope and fear, in an age of both knowledge and ignorance. If this capsule history of our progress teaches us anything, it is that man in his quest for knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. So we are kicking off the Energy Impact podcast with Dr. Stephen Chu, who is a former U.S. Secretary of Energy, a professor of physics at Stanford, and oh yeah, he won a Nobel Prize in physics. Dr. Stephen Chu, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time. I mean, I'd love to you know run through kind of you know like your brief uh, history. I mean, it's just so amazing some of the things that you've accomplished, but. You know, most people today think of uh, uh, you know Google X as like the the fun startupy think tanky Silicon Valley company. But before that, there was something called Bell Labs, and that's where you got your start. Do you want to tell me about you know what it was like to get started and work there back in the day? Well, it was uh, the closest thing to heaven to quite a famous movie <laughs> on Earth. Uh, the Empire State Building of Science Research. Um, when I was hired, I had actually had just accepted a position as assistant professor uh, physics at Berkeley, where I was a graduate student and postdoc, but there was, they've never done that before. But so they said, you know, if you want, you could take a year or two leave of absence, go somewhere else, get, get, uh, but the job is yours. Here's your startup money. Uh, you can do what you want. So I took the money, spent it, uh, uh, but then, um, applied to Bell Labs with the intent of staying there for two years. So when I got there, it was an eye-opening experience. I'd spent all my time at Berkeley as a graduate student postdoc uh, working on very fundamental physics, essentially one question. And uh, all of a sudden I was introduced to a wide range of things in science um, and began to learn about many things, began to do switch fields, um, uh, I was switching fields when I was a graduate student and postdoc, but but in in the first couple of years, but beginning to look into condensed matter physics, other things, um, did some very experiments with an electron and a positron and the spectroscopy, which really has nothing to do with communications, but it was fundamental physics and Bell Labs was willing to support that. So late lasers were, were a big focus of yours, right? Is that? Absolutely. Uh, at that time, when I was hired at Berkeley, I knew how to make lasers. I'm not sure I knew physics, <laughs> uh, but uh, I knew how to make state-of-the-art or better than state-of-the-art lasers and looked around for meaningful experiments to do. Awesome. And positronium spectroscopy was one. Um, did a number of other things in condensed matter physics. Then I was offered and accepted a department chair position uh, at Bell Labs uh, in the other major branch of Bell Labs, not home, uh, Murray Hill, but Homedale. And so I moved down there. And at the time there's a fellow named Art Ashkin who was, had been dreaming of uh, trapping atoms uh, but the work had been shut down for four or five years uh, because they weren't, you know, after some initial great ideas and progress, it, it had stalled. And so I kind of reinvented, um, didn't invent, reinvented. It was an old idea that was around, but I didn't know about it, of that you can use light to cool atoms to ridiculously low temperatures. And if you could do that, then it seemed to me that all these things Ashkin was dreaming about might be possible. And yeah, so what, what can you do? What's the purpose of, of cooling these atoms down, of, of stopping them, of looking at them? What would that might lead to? Well, um, at the time I began the research, I only knew of one thing. It could make a better atomic clock. An atomic clock 
is the world time standard that we use today. And the reason I knew it would be better is if they were so cold, if you turned off your atom trap, your light, they would just fold the bottom of the vacuum can, which meant you can actually push them up. So they go up, turn around, do the gravity, come back down. During that very long time, ballistic, you know, imagine tossing a ball in the air, up a meter and coming back down. You, you know, a good fraction of a second, you can make an exquisite time measurement. So uh, I did this first so-called atomic fountain experiment, not at Bell Labs, but uh, after we cooled and trapped the atoms and had the technology when I first moved to Stanford, that was one of the first things I tried. It worked, uh, we could show that you could make a better atomic clock. And it's remarkable because within seven years from that first publication experiment, demonstration experiment, uh, the Bureau of Standards around the world began to use that and it became the de facto time standard using these atomic fountains. You could also, we also showed in the early 90s that you can quantum mechanically using light pulses, split the atom apart, bring them back together. But when you're apart and back, coming back together, the atomic waves could interfere, but, but it could make a very exquisite measurement. On, for example, we use wave interference of light all the time in so-called interferometers. And so then people began to think, can you make an atom interferometer? We weren't the first, we were the second, there were two papers that came in first, Three months later, our paper came in using light pulses, but we were the most accurate by far. Uh, and within a year or two, we got the first experiment, we got a part in a million measurements, second experiment, uh, par, uh, part in 10 to the um, eight measurement accuracy. And then soon thereafter, a part in a billion. Uh, that means you can watch atoms drop due to gravity and measure the dropping by a part in a billion. Now they've gotten another three or four decimal places. And this is so fundamentally this, understand how we think of measurement altogether. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but now we actually measure distance as a function of light. And is that partially because of our more precise ability now to, uh, to use these tools? Yes, except it's not a measurement. Um, what we know is we can measure time. Time is the, the stake in the ground. And so, uh, so time is our international standard. And then everything else that we can gets related to time. How far does light travel in a certain amount of time? That's the definition of distance now. Yep. The definition of an ohm has, has to do with the frequency. The definition of virtually everything is now shifting, including the kilogram to measurements in frequency. I see, so we now we have a common reference point for all other forms of measurement. Right, and so as physics tells us, there's an intimate connection between X and y, and time, Y and time, Z and time, and all these other things. And so we're slowly beginning to define as many things as we can as a function of time. Time, it's an arbitrary reference, how many cycles of an atom, atomic uh, cycles in an atom. Uh, so it's just a definition. This is how much a second means, X number of cycles, but we can measure time to 40, 15 now, relative time to 20 digits. Unbelievable. Right. <laughs> <And we're laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just un unbelievable uh, where this has taken us. And, and so you actually w ended up winning a Nobel Prize for this? Yes, for the technologies that uh, cooled atoms at very low temperature and for optical trapping. And it came pretty quickly. I mean, I started to do this work in 1983, 84, 80, 84 really in earnest. 85 was our first publication. Uh, 86, we trapped atoms with light. 87, we made this magneto optic trap, became, became the workhorse. Everybody could do it. It became very easy. And so the Nobel Prize was in 97. So that's 12 years. Uh, that's pretty quick by Fast. Nobel Prize standards. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, you know, here you are and you've got this, you know, foundation in uh, applications of physics. And at, at what point did your interests uh, or introduction into energy systems and like real energy start to manifest in your life? Yeah, good question. First, uh, I did physics, and then uh, with the 
technology to do physics, uh, Ashton discovered you can hold on bacteria with these so-called optical traps, optical tweezers. And I said, if you can do that, you can hold on to biological molecules. And so I did that. And so beginning in the late 80s, early 90s, I began to go into biology. And by the year 2000, uh, I got a Nobel Prize in 1997 for the atomic physics work. But by the year 2000, the majority of my stuff was in biology. Mm. Uh, but in the same token, I began to read as an interested layperson the stuff about climate change. Yeah. And, and, you know, just as a scientist, I began to look at this stuff and said, you know, they may have something there. You know, I said, eh, I'm a little skeptical. As I read more and more about it, I said, no, this might be real. The risks might be real. I began to stick in the ends of talks, little comments about climate change that, that one should, you know, some more scientists should really look at what's going on here. Um, and, and so that was increasing in the, you know, year 2000 to a one, two, three. And in 2004, um, some people asked what I would consider throwing my hat in the ring to be director of Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. It's a Department of Energy lab immediately adjacent to Berkeley, does no classified work. It's a strictly science lab, not to confuse with Lawrence Livermore lab, mm. which is one of the uh, atomic weapons labs. Right. And, and so I, so it's, it's a very different laboratory. I, when I was a graduate student and postdoc there, I was a member of Launch Berkeley Lab. And so I have fond memories of the place. And, uh, but I said, no, I'm happy where I am at Stanford. I'm not interested. And I said, no, again. And then finally, the then director of the lab said, look, you know, we just want to, you know, why don't you come and visit? And if there's a 5% chance you might take the job, why don't you apply for it? So I, I came and visited, and, you know, and, and my, that form, the director at the time was my former boss at Bell Labs. He was the director when I went to Homedale that did the laser cooling and trapping work. And then I said to myself, look, I'm talking about energy, climate change. Here's this great laboratory. Uh, by great laboratory, I mean that roughly 15 people worked in the lab uh, were employees, uh, had gotten Nobel Prizes. Uh, over about three dozen uh, people who started their careers, either as graduate students, postdocs, or young scientists at the lab, got Nobel Prizes. That is better than most universities in the world, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, so much. when I say great, I mean really, truly outstandingly great. Yeah, um, that's a lot and, of parking spots I've got to reserve for them. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I thought, you know, this is such a great science laboratory. If I can get more of the basic scientists interested in energy climate change, I could move the needle in a way I could not move it by just giving a few talks mm -hmm. or or through my own research. Yeah, you're so I your went problems. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, so I went there um, and started talking more about the you know, the risk of climate change. It says, doesn't have to be a certainty. There's a big risk out there. And uh, science and technology can really change the landscape of the choices we had. My friends there, you know, remember I was long associated with Berkeley and said, well, we don't know anything about energy. I said, well, neither did I. Let's teach ourselves. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> so we would, you know, there were half a dozen of us meet every week for an hour, hour and a half. And these are very high profile, great scientists who sometimes were too busy to go to their own department meetings. <laughs> but but for you know brainstorming and, and beginning to self-teach, we did this. We used to had retreats, half-day retreats. We had open mic forum to discuss this and sort of raised the awareness and interest first of the awareness that this could be a real problem. Yeah. But I said, if you have anything technically that can contribute to this, why not just think about it? So it's not an order. It's not, here's where the money is, go and do this. Uh, but it was uh, an intellectual thing. And I, I remember when I was at the lab, I said, look, this, this is going to generate some great science as well. Yeah. Uh, because the solutions to this problem 
will naturally include a bunch of Nobel Prizes <laughs> because we need some really good new dramatic science. I did not anticipate that, you know, one of them came true very early, namely the lithium ion battery got a Nobel Prize. Right. Uh, but I think there are several more for sure. Um, yeah, it's, because it's, it's almost like the space race, you, you know, getting the space was you know lofty goal unto itself, but a lot of technology is and better understandings better understanding of science and, and combustion and, 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 uh, and rocketry and who knows, all these things have, have fallen and material science have fallen out of this really hard problem that you put a lot of brains around to solve. Yeah, uh, in that respect, I agree with you, but it, it, it's even better than that because there's a lot of things. The space race was essentially, we kind of knew the basic science mm -hmm. and became an applied science slash engineering problem. Ah. Yes, there were material problems, Jason, you know, how to design the best rocket engines, all this other stuff, but, but we kind of knew about that. In this new frontier, there are a lot of things we don't know. Ah, okay. <laughs> and we need dramatically better batteries. The batteries are getting really low cost. They drop a factor of tenfold in the last 10 years. They're going to drop another two or threefold. But one of the things we really need is fast charging batteries. Mm. What do I mean by that? I mean, Let's say you have a car that goes 350 miles on a battery. Yep. If you can fill it up and within five minutes add 200 mile range, so it's only partially discharged, and add 200 more miles in five minutes, there would be no more range anxiety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you could, you could, go, you know, and you can put these fast charge stations in interstates or in service stations. Uh, because in those times when you just don't want to wait around, uh, that's it. Uh, and, and so the, solving these almost um, human problems that would contribute towards addressing climate change pose a host of technical challenges. There are some like basic physics and chemistry problems, like basic physics and chemistry problems to solve as well. Basic physics, chemistry, and biology. Let me talk about something else. Yeah. Um, uh, the are agriculture and our raising of animals uh, contributes more to gr greenhouse gas emissions than electricity generation around the world. Unreal. Okay. And, uh, and so how do you, how do you, how do you change that? Because unless you change that, uh, that's a major sector of emissions. Uh, another sector, a major sector are structural materials, steel, cement, for example. Uh, and industrial pla you know, plastics and chemicals. That lap together is also another kind of one electricity generation worth of greenhouse gas emissions, okay? Yep. And so, so we need cement that doesn't have this huge green, and steel that doesn't have these greenhouse gas emissions. The plastics come from fossil fuel. Uh, so they inherit, if they're biodegradable, then they get recycled with carbon dioxide and methane, and then and you're adding more to it. So, so these are, the fundamental issues. Um, in the case of biology, there are you know some real new innovations in the last decade or two. Uh, one of them, uh, CRISPR-Cas9, which is uh, a way to edit genes in a much more precise way uh, that opens up the possibility that you can genetically mo modify microbes and plants. And so you can imagine, uh, intensive fertilizer plant like corn. What if you can get this corn to interact with microbes the way legumes do to make its own fertilizer, nitrogen-based fertilizer? Then you've eliminated one or 2% of, you know, nitrogen-based fertilizer uh, is one or 2% of greenhouse gas emissions, but it's worse than that. That's in the making of it. Right. But if farmers over fertilize, then the nitrogen runoff ends up being N2O, which is another potent greenhouse gas. Yep. So, so can you make self-fertilizing plants? And the answer is yes. And, and so this has begun. And so was all this stuff, um, I mean, what you're talking about now, you know, I probably read about in the last, you know, few years in you know, popular science like publications, were you getting some early insight as to the possibilities you know, when you were still in this director position and just kind of like laying out the framework, or you just know that there was going to be a big field of opportunity? No, we we're definite, definite uh, uh, things. Uh, when I was director of Lawrence Berkeley Lab, uh, a, a, a chemical engineer named Jay Kuesling had just used microbes to make 
uh, a precursor to an anti-malarial drug that's found in plants in Southeast Asia. So you got a big Gates grant for that and it was a big deal, okay? Because, hey, microbes can now make an anti-malarial drug. And so it got a lot of headlines. Uh, I said, Jay, you know, I know you want to go to another disease, but how about use this technology? Can you use it to uh, make uh, agriculture greener or even better still, can you use it to make fuels that are substitutes uh, for uh, petroleum-based uh, fuel? Yep. And so, you know, we started moving around. I went and got a, another person who's very good at this stuff, a, a plant biologist, a chemist, uh, at Stanford named Chris Field, who was at the Stanford Woods Institute. So I recruited him to come to Berkeley and Berkeley Lab, stolen from Stanford, uh, which was very disloyal. But <laughs> I was still a faculty member at Stanford as well as a faculty member at Berkeley. <laughs> and um, we got a half a billion dollars from BP to do this research over 10 years. Uh, and now, in hindsight, it was a little premature. Do You cannot... You know, at that time we thought, oh, the price of oil is $100 a barrel of oil, it could go to $200 a barrel, then you can compete. But of course we didn't anticipate many, many things uh, and you can't compete at $50, $60 a barrel or $40 a barrel. But that was before CRISPR-Cas9, that was before a, a bunch of other things. So we, we actually started this in 2009, 2010, uh, a little bit premature, but now, you know, at, you know, a decade later, we're in a very different place. Um, I'm still very gung-ho optimistic. Um, but now there are these new powerful tools of robotics, CRISPR-Cas systems, artificial intelligence. And I'm on, on the board of a startup company that I joined after I came back out of the sector of energy, where they're using genetic manipulation to grow stuff. Uh, these are microbes that make stuff not fuels, because that's still too cheap. But uh, believe it or not, thin films that are used for cell phones. Uh, new mosquito repellents that could, you know, replace D, which has some harmful side effects. All sorts of stuff like that. Those are the starting tools based on biology that as you go down the learning curve, eventually you want to go back to fuels and plastics. So already some of the thin film plastics are being made commercially. Which is very exciting. So, but uh, yeah, you skipped over a point there. At some point, you became Secretary of Energy. How did that? How did that happen? You know, so you're developing this expertise, this understanding of climate and energy systems. You're, you know, you're becoming, you know, one of the the foremost experts. But how did that translate into actually being? I mean, was it just your reputation w was so strong at that point that the president called you up and said, "Hey, get over here." Well, uh, it's it's kind of interesting. So, uh, so I've been. You know, I joined the summer of 2004 uh, at Berkeley, and and there uh, there's a lot of chatter. Hey, there's here's a serious practicing scientist who's actually not bad at being an administrator, <laughs> <laughs> which is <laughs> uh, and able to rally the troops not by orders but by you know inspiration uh, and leadership. Yeah, getting people getting people excited about it. Yeah. And, uh, and so when Obama w won the election, people said, oh, you know, he might actually be Secretary of Energy. And I don't, you know, I don't, didn't know him. I didn't publicly campaign for him or anybody in my life. I was very apolitical. Uh, but then the third week in November, I get this phone call. Um, and it says the president like would like you to fly to Chicago and talk to you about a very important job. And I said, oh, look, I'm happy here. But not only that, I was looking forward to stepping down from being director of Berkeley and going back to the lab. I was still a practicing scientist. But I said, but how important? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a mumble mumble on the other end of the line, a secretary of energy. Mm. And I thought, okay, for that, I will fly to Chicago. <laughs> That's worth my time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's worth my time. Um, I may not have it was for a science advisor or something like that, or undersecretary. Definitely not for undersecretary <laughs> or deputy secretary. Uh, and so I flew to Chicago. You know, there's this rented building. I go up there. It's 
and they said, well, okay, why don't you wait in this room? It's this kind of warmest room. It's, you know, and I said, okay, it makes sense. The president's from Hawaii. He likes warm rooms. <laughs> <laughs> or the president like. And then Obama walks in, you know, uh, uh, and uh, alone. And for the next hour, we talk. Yeah. Wow. You know, what do you think about this? What do you about this? And we just chatted. And, and then, uh, because... You know, he wanted to know what I thought about these things, what it was like, things like that. He he actually walked in the room and said, everybody's telling me you should be our next new secretary of energy. And I got up and shook hands and said, who are these future former friends of mine? <laughs> <laughs> he just ignored it. <laughs> Again, I wasn't looking for a bureaucratic job. In fact, yeah. I was looking to step down yeah. Yeah. and uh, ignored it. And so, but after this, conversation which just lasted about an hour uh, Axel Rod was there a few others were there uh, I didn't know any of these people um, I was impressed and I called my wife at home and and said look if this guy asked me to be secretary of energy I will say yes yeah and a couple of weeks later I uh, said uh, we'd like you to we'd like to nominate you for secretary of energy yeah so I said yes uh, it that's a life-changing job uh, for sure uh, and uh, uh, but I have to say that that president uh, Obama was very unusual he began to hire people who were not politically connected to him yeah but who and just based on what he's hearing yeah. about who are the best people for this job and you may or may not remember but when the, he put together his cabinet, there was all sorts of um, comparisons of Obama's cabinet to Lincoln's cabinet. You know, uh, Lincoln was uh, a political newbie. <laughs> you know, the first president not to have been born in the 13 original states, you know, from a backwards place <laughs> in, in Illinois coming to town. And so what he did is he started hiring people in his cabinet who, who were his political rivals mm. on both sides of the aisle. And he was hiring the best people he could find, yeah. which is amazing. Yeah. And so we were known as the team of rivals, which turned out not to be the case. We were actually a genial group of people, even though we, you know, we're strong-willed and outspoken and things like that. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes we disagree, but, but it, um, you know, but would sort itself out and and obama was willing to hire these people listen if you can disagree with a group respectfully that is the best way to learn right there's no better way to absorb information than to find a bunch of really smart people who disagree with you well the respectful part sometimes comes and sometimes goes <laughs> i mean i remember once when i'm in the roosevelt room and uh larry summers and i had a different opinion uh, economist and and larry larry is a smart guy and he you know uh, uh and and so you know i said no larry you're wrong and so we started <laughs> jousting a bit everybody's backing off <laughs> and just watching <laughs> so so but you know in the end we became friends i mean he came in very skeptical he said yeah you want to do all this stuff and spend a lot of money and energy uh, and that will create jobs, but you can also create jobs by asking people to dig, big, dig a big hole. And yeah, after you yeah. dig a hole, you just fill up the hole. Yeah, like at Hanford. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, we can get to that later. Get but, to that later, yeah. But uh, I said, no, no, no. This is this is this this is real. This is what we're going to need. And you know, and you know, and so by the time he was there, he was skeptical. He's now since come around and recognizes that climate change is a very big deal. Yeah. So, but a lot of the financial guys did not see it that way. Well, what was your mandate? Like when you first took office, was your mandate to, I mean, I, I think most people have a sense of what the like official role of the secretary of energy is, you know, it has the weapons component and then, you know, the national labs and, but what was your like personal mandate in private conversations with the president when he said, listen, you are going to be successful if you do X, what was that X? Well, it, uh, it was, and this was a very, very common ground. I mean, we want to take steps to decarbonize the country. Yeah. And that means you do research that would lead to deployment of renewable technologies. Uh, we, but we also, uh, I felt that nuclear 
possibly could have a place uh, because you need some uh, backup power. So I was very pro nuclear and pro small modular reactors. Yeah, you, I mean, you wrote about that as early as uh, 2010, I believe, in the Wall Street Journal. You right. published this piece, and I mean, it, see, it seems so prescient reading it now because I mean, we're very involved, you know, with nuclear experts, and they're almost repeating even today and really trying to commercialize this stuff. But along the same theme of the things that you wrote about all the way back then before there was a, a small modular reactor or a new nuclear industry, you were essentially, uh, I mean, you were saying what the world is gonna look like. Well, uh, you know, that's even before I made secondary of energy. I said, look, you know, we're gonna need nuclear, you know, because we're gonna need backup power. You can't go to hundred percent renewables. We don't have that because we, we don't have the batteries. You know, batteries do peak load shifting Yeah. Uh, in order to, to store energy for even a week, the cost of the batteries has to be about $30 a kilowatt hour, which is one tenth of what they are today, yeah. not in 2009, 2010, but today. So, so saying that we need nuclear though is, is not always the most popular position to take. What were conversations you know, with the president like about that when, when you were saying, no, 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 this is like, a, we can't just ignore this energy source. We know it's got a bad political rep, but we need to focus on it. What, what, was the, what, what happened after that? Well, I wasn't down selecting. I, I said there are two choices yeah. for backup power. Yeah. It, it, because batteries weren't going to do the thing. Hydro is, is limited. And so the two choices are fossil with carbon capture, natural gas with carbon capture, or nuclear. And so I was putting money into both. Yeah. Yeah. And both uh, I mean, smart. <laughs> And guess what? Nothing has changed. Yeah, nothing has changed. <laughs> exactly. The, the thing that has changed is that many people came around to carbon capture. Yeah. Because at first people said, no, no, if you have carbon capture, that's an excuse for keeping the fossil industry going. And you're only going to capture 90, 95% of the carbon, which is true. To capture 100% would be prohibitively expensive. Yeah, yeah. And so it's not as good. And I said, yes, it's not as good. But so are turning off the lights. Yeah. And <laughs> And speaking of carbon capture, because, yeah, that seems to be another like emotional topic that I always thought was like a, a, an obvious no brainer. I mean, I, I've spent time researching you know, this idea of direct air capture, where if it seems that you had a cheap enough, low carbon enough energy source to power direct air ca capture, then you know, not only could you, you know, offset any emissions that were hard to decarbonize, but we could take care of legacy emissions as well that are still adding, you know, collecting, you know, a net addition of heat, you know, year over year. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, there's certain uh, carbon emissions which you just cannot capture. You're not going to be capturing carbon emissions from an airplane unless the fuel it burns has been made from biosource material that that is, has captured carbon in order to make the fuel. Yeah. Uh, and so that's the only way you're going to get neutral on an airplane. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and there's also lots of long haul shipping uh, ships and things like that, which, you know, you need. And so in order to get to zero carbon everywhere, if you look at what you need to do, uh, it's going to be hard in some instances. So you need negative emissions from somewhere else. Yep. And so air capture is absolutely one of the necessary things now. Now, that means you start with capture from point sources, because that's easier. Right, yeah, higher concentration, <laughs> less, yeah, less Yeah, and, you know, from cement, steel, power, plastics, you name it, all that stuff, uh, that's easier. Uh, it's estimated to be roughly two or three times cheaper. Uh, but then from that, those learning experiences, you go to air capture. We're going to need it all. Yep. And we definitely will need air capture before the end of this century. Yep. So, so you got the, the ball rolling. I mean, we made an offhand joke about, okay, not much has changed, but you really got the ball rolling. And I see you know, pockets of innovation and, and you know, commercialization and venture capital, you know, really getting involved more than ever now. So obviously, like, we've, we've got some momentum. But what do you think, you know, where do you think we're still lacking, either in, uh, like, policy direction or you know technical gaps that you know if if you were back in the role again today, where would you focus our attention? Having seen the last ten years, yeah, a, a couple of places. Uh, this is, and I'll start with one that I was pushing before I was uh, Secretary of Energy, and that is 
in order to go more towards clean energy and a robust energy system, you need not only local generation storage, you need long distance transmission, very efficient transmission. Our power system uh, isn't like that, even though there's, you know, there are three major power systems, the East, the West, and Texas. Uh, <laughs> um, within those three major power systems, there are a lot of little utility companies. And, and, um, and if you look in regions where there's cheap energy, for example, in the Pacific Northwest, lots of hydro, a very inexpensive energy, uh, you will want to take some of the hydropower and bring it, bring it elsewhere, uh, like the California and other places. Um, uh, but they don't want it because that would make, make their energy prices go up a little, even though the average will go down. In the Northeast, you have pretty expensive electricity. And yet there's, to the north of that, Canada, who's got oodles of hydropower, want to sell it to the Northeast. But the people in the Northeast say, well, we don't really want it because we just invested in a new gas plant. And if you bring in cheap, uh, you know, carbon-free energy source from Canada, you know, we get a stranded asset here. So they did the logical thing. They convinced all the good citizens of Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, New York, you don't want power lines in your backyard. <laughs> <laughs> so so i was getting to watch all of this yeah. in real time yeah uh but but um, but i'm saying we still you know imagine you know with all the wind resources uh, from north Dakota all the way to texas with all the solar sources especially in the southwest with all the hydro resources you can wrap this up and begin to get a pretty robust energy system if you could transmit over long distances and and get around the local politics of you know energy is about money yeah uh, but but if you did that the, the average energy bill in the United States goes down and so you got to try to keep people whole but you know make this transition now especially the solar and wind you need the great thing is you know we don't have the same weather in every place in the United States which is another thing okay so we have the technology to do this but there's no there was no political will. When I was secretary, I was just trying to get something simple going in the, in this, uh, the Western part of the United States, which is an energy rebalancing. So, you know, if, if you're, this company's a little low on energy and this one's, you get to swap it and make it so that it's financially much easier to do things. And I saw the same politics. They went immediately to the people in Congress and said, the secretary of energy is trying to ruin us. <laughs> It was this energy rebalancing. We don't want, you know, because they, you know, they look at, the, they can always see, we like, we're making lots of money the way it is now. Why yeah. do I want to change? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this sounds like not a technical problem. Though. No, it's not a technical problem. <laughs> it's a political problem. Yeah. I mean, it, so are you getting to that, that needs to be so, like in order to solve our climate and energy problems? Oh, like I think you need, uh, everybody says you need a smarter grid. Yeah. For this. Yeah. Absolutely true. You also need a smarter transmission. It's transmission and distribution. The grid, we think of distribution, but you want long distance transmission. If you had long distance transmission and Texas allowed lines outside the border, uh, they would not have suffered the blackouts they would have suffered yeah. uh, because of the bad weather. Uh, and, and so you automatically buy into a much more robust system. What is real scary is that Europe was going more towards integrating transmission in Europe than the United States was. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And Those are different countries. countries. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> We're one country, you know, and, and so there's, you know, though I much prefer our way of governing ourselves in the U.S., uh, there's one advantage China has. <laughs> this is the way it's going to be done yeah. for right of way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and they're the world leader in long distance transmission yep. because of that. Um, but OK, but we can still see, you know, even in cases like China, where it's a, a top down edict um, and they are making a tremendous amount of progress in clean energy. They're still also adding dirty sources, and you know, throughout Southeast Asia, certainly a lot of dirty sources. So it's like, and and this is a global problem. So even if we were to magically wave a wand, fix the U.S. politics, build a bunch of you know transmission rebalance and all this other stuff, it doesn't mean that we're solving the full problem of of climate change across the globe. So how do you think about it from that perspective as a global? Yeah, yeah, excellent question. So here's here's the thing about that. Um, 
part of the progress, there's a political aspect and a policy aspect. So I would say policy, forget the politics, but the policy aspect and the technical aspect. And when you have better technical solutions, you can go lighter hand on the policy, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, cars replace horses in cities very quickly within a decade and a half. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and the reason was a pollution problem. You know, the horse manure is piling up in cities and along comes a poopless carriage. <laughs> and this is great. <laughs> no, I, like, I like where you're going with this, yeah. I'm a bit of a and, technophile myself, so yeah, I see this. And, and so, you know, the reason, you know, solar became very cheap. Uh, for a while, India wasn't doing it because they wanted to protect local Indian solar companies, but eventually they said, no, that's ridiculous. So, so then you do this. So as in when you get energy storage becoming very cheap, when, when electric vehicles become cheaper to own and operate than a gasoline powered vehicle, uh, the personal choice is you just get an electric vehicle, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, but then you need more clean electricity generation. Now, what you say about coal, new coal is true. Um, I think China's current pledge is by 20, so we're 2021, I think it was 2030, they will stop increasing the, you know, first they made pledges on uh, energy intensity, you know, energy per GDP. Yeah. But now they're actually saying by 2030, we will plateau. And by 24, we will begin to bring it down. Yeah. Total carbon emission yeah. period. Yeah. Okay. And I, I, I think they're pretty serious about that. Uh, again, it's a it's a kind of a technocratic run organization. Uh, you know, I don't agree with the political system, but they have a lot of engineers yeah. in their upper- In politics, yeah. In politics, yeah. right. Trained as engineers, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is, you know, has some advantages. Um, so, but, but let's go back to these new technologies. If you can get all this stuff and you can get electrical systems and you can figure out substitutes for cement and steel. That's a very big deal in the developing world. Uh, you know, three quarters of India's building infrastructure does not exist today that would be built by 2040. Okay, wow. that, that's a lot of steel and concrete, yeah. which means a lot of carbon emissions. Yeah. And so, uh, so then you redouble your efforts to find low carbon substitutes for producing steel or substituting for cement. Uh, that's where I think the United States and the Department of Energy in particular had a huge calling. You know, we got to figure this out. Now, if we don't figure it out, if no one figures it out, we've got a problem. Yeah. Because we're not, we cannot tell starting with China and India, but sub-Saharan Africa, you're not allowed to build more buildings. We build our buildings, but you're not. <laughs> this, that doesn't, that's a non-starter. Yeah. Uh, so, so you want to build in a better way and in a cleaner way. And so again. And, and was there any thought of um, I, I, like, you know, more moonshotty type stuff? I mean, I've always thought, well, you know, part of the carbon emissions come from these like building materials, structural materials, but certain plastics, you know, hydrocarbons, you know, uh, yeah, I could read off a list are almost as good as like, you know, steel or aluminum, but they're so expensive to make, but they're sequester, they're natural sequesters of carbon. And so I'm wondering, was ever this idea of like a carbon economy kind of pitched where, hey, if we just made structural uh, you know, materials out of carbon, you know, market force, you know, cheaper than ones that are made in a carbon positive manner, uh, that the market forces would just solve this problem itself? Cheaper, definitely. Uh, but even, you know, let's even plan in the next 20, 30 years, there'll be a 60 or $80 a ton on CO2, which is actually not that much uh, to help. Um, but you're right on in the sense that if you can start to use agricultural based materials that fix carbon, you, most people don't realize the amount of carbon being dragged out of the air with just our agriculture and grazing land is equal to this greenhouse gas emissions of the world. It's so crazy, yeah. <laughs> it is crazy. <laughs> Natural, and that's not Brazilian rainforest. Yeah. I'm talking about the yeah. plants we- yeah, That's steady state we're talking about, yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm talking about the stuff we grow for food and for animal food. 
You're saying we can get the carbon into the soil or- We can get the carbon into the plants. Now, what happens is the plants then die, they rot and they get recycled. So 99 point, whatever it is, 5% just gets recycled. Yeah. Uh, there's a deeper appreciation that we've been getting carbon out of the soil with modern agricultural practices, deep plowing, things like that. And so now there's a recognition, why don't we think of putting carbon back into the yeah. soil. It makes the soil more productive. Yeah. Uh, and again, this biology and chemistry that's gonna help do that um, because, because the mechanization of farming, before when you just had to scratch the surface, you weren't doing much. Yeah. But once you get a diesel tractor, boy, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's a very different uh, thing. And so the mechanization allowed us to produce lots of food and irrigation, things like that. The next agricultural revolution we need is one which is becomes very low carbon or, or carbon neutral, but it can be carbon negative. Yeah. Because if you take the residues of all the plants, you know, the wheat straw, the rice straw, the corn silver, you put half the corn silver back in the ground that's necessary for fertilization, but the rest it, you don't need. Uh, the rice straw and wheat straw, we used to burn, but now in many developed countries, you're not allowed to do that. So what do they do? They bury it. When they bury it, it turns into methane. Right, which is even worse than the carbon yeah. dioxide. And so, so imagine having a science which you can economically take this stuff, this mostly cellulosic stuff, and turn it into chemicals. And you start with high-value plastics yeah. Yeah. or things like that, and then you work your way to fuels. Now, nobody, a very visible target is the structural material. Can you use chemistry? Because, you know, structural material, cement is really cheap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and it works. Yeah. Uh, uh, but you can start with, uh, you know, with steels and rebar, you can, you know, electro uh, steel making will come back, I think. Uh, but the coking process is still carbon. And so you look at all these things and say, okay, this is what we have to think about. Yep. And so, you know, I started this at LBNL and it continued as Secretary of Energy, but continued afterwards, keeping in your head, what are the new breakthroughs that are happening every week, every month, every year, and saying, could this be useful? Uh, and and, uh, and, to, and the, so this is what, the world has to look at, you know, you get a certain breakthrough over here. And since, you know, uh, energy touches everything, energy, water, food, it's all one big issue now. Yeah. And that's why, I mean, yeah, energy touches everything. I think that's a key point. And that's why, you know, I was so impressed with, you know, your argument, uh, you know, coming back to onto the nuclear side of things and how, why I thought that was so prescient, because so many of these, you know, site specific issues, that you know, even if we made tremendous advances in wind or tremendous advances in solar, um, you, you're still limited by you know, where you can put them and you know, some of the intermittency issues. But it just seemed to me like such a, it, it seems to me like a, a much simpler solution if we had you know, cost effective, you know, factory produced, you know, nuclear style battery power plants that could just be dropped and plugged in place around the world. It, it seems to me if we, could if we could deliver little nuclear plants like we could deliver cars, we'd have cheaper energy to then power the transformation of all these other sectors as well. Yeah, and, and the nuclear can supply the process heat. It has to be, uh, be able to go up and down in power. They are the first generation nuclear reactors US installed, what they were actually second generation, uh, were designed to be maintain a steady power. Um, the ones in Europe with the same design uh, have been used for a decade or two to ramp up down to 50% power and back up once or twice a day. So that technology, you can do this. Then the question is, can you design a reactor to go from 5% power to 100% power in a couple of hours? Uh, if you do that, then it could be great because the future of nuclear power and won't be for base load, it will be for when you run out of wind solar. Okay. Mm. And, and, and why, so, why is that though? Just to push back on that, if it were cheaper than wind or solar, and uh, and you got to those economics by you know, scaling up production, just like wind and solar got to those economics by scaling up production, why why would you why would we see them as a supplement to wind and solar instead of the foundation? Uh, because of the words you said, if they're cheaper. 
I see. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so because of the regulatory issues, because of the safety concerns uh, and the fears of contamination, uh, they, you, so, so you are going to have to make, you know, so my dream would be you can make small, you know, 50, 100 megawatt reactors, modular in size. Uh, you can run them and not refuel for five, 10 years. Uh, and then maybe refuel just once. Uh, you take the whole core of that and you put it in a deep borehole. So the great thing about that idea is that you can, we've got roughly a hundred locally stored uh, spent fuel canisters in, in the United States. And we haven't figured out a repository of where to put them, even just transporting them from their current sites to some central set of repositories is going to meet with resistance. You know, they don't want a truck carrying spent fuel, highly, highly reactive materials through their town. Once again, not because it's a technical problem, but because it's a political or social. It's a political social problem because what if you had an accident and you had a spillage and then you had contamination? You know, um, many more people die from coal plant emissions than from nuclear per unit electricity. Yeah. And, and so that the new design of the small modules are with that in mind. When I was Secretary of Energy, this is the first goal. Yeah. They have to be yeah. passively contamination free. Yeah, no, I, I think it's brilliant. Um, and then and then if that were achieved, uh, you know, then we would then we could and then you know serialized and you know manufactured and the cost comes down. It seems like this could be, you know, like a, a real foundation of you know a carbon free future. W where do you see that going, and and how come we don't just have like a space race to do that? Just small, passive, safe nuclear. Um, I think the world should do that because you, you but you've got to make them thousands at a time. Yeah. Uh, at a factory where you have real quality control, and you've got to convince the public that contamination is not going to be an issue. Uh, because what nuclear gives you is a compact energy source. Yeah. And if you have a compact energy source that can be turned and ramped up and down, uh, then this is great. Um, because, you know, as good as wind and solar are, you know, they're pretty land intensive. Or now, offshore wind is, is better, but and it's going to get cheaper. Um, and so, but you, it's even the best offshore wind sites are blowing, they're turning the turbines 50, maybe projected up to 60% of the time, which is really good. Yeah. Okay. But not 100% of the time <laughs> and not on demand. So, so again, uh, we do need um, energy on demand sources, whether it's an energy storage or, or something else. So either it means energy storage in the form of thermal energy storage electrical energy storage, water energy storage, any of those things, uh, and or turn on power. Yep. And um, so, you know, your involvement today, you know, in this space, obviously, you know, you've accumulated this wealth of knowledge, you, you kickstarted the whole thing, you, you know, and you're sitting on the boards of some companies. Are, are there other roles that you see yourself playing, you know, moving forward into the future as, you know, this just becomes more and more pressing of a, of a global issue? Well, a couple of roles. First, uh, in my own research, I'm working on a couple of things. Um, we just published a paper on getting lithium from seawater. Uh, if that is works commercially, that means you've increased the lithium supply about 5,000 fold. Yep. Uh, that doesn't mean you shouldn't recycle lithium, <laughs> but it makes the lithium price yeah. issue go away. Cobalt, uh, you got to make batteries without cobalt. Cobalt's going to be too expensive if if two thirds of the personal vehicles and lots of stationary storage run on batteries. Cobalt is just out of the it just out of, even nickel becomes an issue, but cobalt is just out of the question. And uh, so I'm working on a lithium metal sulfur battery. We've got, you know, up to our eyeballs in sulfur. Uh, so, so I do it that way. So, and, you know, um, Back the postdoc who worked on, yeah. on lithium recovery is now an assistant professor at the University of Chicago. She's continuing that work. I've, you know, uh, Royal Dutch Shell is interested in this stuff. Uh, 
Uh, electrochemistry in general is, is a very important topic. Um, if you get more efficient electrochemistry uh, then, and cheap electricity, then you, you can go to hydrogen as uh, a cheaper battery. And, you know, it's just converting one form of energy, uh, solar wind, into another form, hydrogen, which you can then use for products, but for as an energy carrier. Uh, how do you make electrochemistry cheaper? Well, the catalysts are pretty good, but they're expensive. But another important point that most material scientists don't realize is you have to lower the footprint uh, of the electrochemical plant because footprint in size has a lot to do with cost. Cost, yep. <laughs> I, you see big, you just see lots of money. You see smaller, you see less money. Yep. And so <laughs> uh, this is something I really began to appreciate when I was Secretary of Energy that I would not have really felt in my bones had I been a, just a scientist. Yeah, the real life. Uh, and, and so, uh, so we're working on that. Uh, and so, so on the research side, I, I can see these little things. Um, on the policy side, you know, you know, I give, I will give advice to people who are governments who wanted. Uh, so far, surprisingly, the past uh, administration didn't want any advice from me. <laughs> Go figure. I was not surprised. <laughs> uh, uh, this one does, um, and you know, I, I think. Um, uh, and not only the federal government, but, you know, California, but, but um, also to help people become aware that there are new things coming down the pike. Keep your eyes open. You've heard this refrain over and over again. I've heard it for 20 plus years, 30 years. You know, we have all the technology we need. We just need the political will. And I'm saying, no, 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 no. If you have better technology, you need less political will. <laughs> They're intrinsically <laughs> tied together. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And and it's a, you know and since energy is about money and most decisions are about money, uh, you know the goal is not can you do it. You know, yeah, you can go to the moon, but it costs a lot of money <laughs> to go to the moon or to Mars, right? And and to get stuff into deployment in agriculture, in power generation, in transportation, in everything we use, uh, it's about money. Can you get self-fertilizing plants more productive than farmers uh, can get make more profit? That's where all of a sudden, hey, no more political will. <laughs> they move in that direction. Yeah, you have to align uh, the incentives of you know personal short-term gains with long-term environmental gains. Right, that's right. So as we wrap up, uh, maybe you can just kind of you know put on your seer hat and paint the most optimistic picture for the future of humanity that you can in the coming decades. What do you see? Um, the the recognition that uh, uh, the climate risks are very real. Uh, in fact, that some of the predictions that I never thought I'd live to see are coming true. Uh, so, so the acknowledgement that there is an issue, but the most optimistic thing is that science continues to move dramatically and that you get very quick uh, advances uh, in discovery, in innovation, and then in large-scale deployment. Uh, and it's only when you get large scale deployment that it really matters, you know, of the 40 plus gigatons, 40 to 50 carbon dioxide equivalent gigatons we emit per year. Uh, how do you bring that to zero and actually to negative? Negative is very important uh, because we're about 410, 415 parts per million now. Um, uh, we look historically where the the earth was when it was that high, it's not a good place. Right. Uh, I think we're going to unfortunately go over 450 or even 500 parts per million, yep. maybe even 550. Uh, but, and so a lot of the long-term things, uh, there's time to fix. And I'll tell you why, and this is easy to understand. The bottoms of the ocean are very cold. There is slow temperature mixing. You've done something to the atmosphere. So apart from the solar cycles every 11 years, energy in roughly the same, really roughly the same. Energy out less, right? 
So that means you warm up. How long does it take to warm up? Well, you got very cold oceans. You go down two kilometers and it's pretty close to damn near freezing. In fact, you go two meters in the ocean and you get cold, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> you can just notice that. Uh, so, so before the earth warms up and you actually enter and go into really different cycles and you weaken the, uh, uh, the Gulf Stream and all this other stuff, you got to get the carbon dioxide back out of the air before the oceans warm up. How long time you have? Well, you know, 50, 100 years. You know, at, you know, 200, 300 years. Yep. And so, so you got to get, you know, so suppose we're in a world of 550. You got to get back down to 400 or 350. Yep. Yeah. So before I let you go, that's actually one point that I'm really glad that you brought up that brought me into the climate and energy space. But I see no recognition of, uh, you know, uh, across you know, scientific and political circles, this idea that net zero actually isn't enough. Because you know we've got a radiative forcing of three watts per square meter at the current level, we're going to go higher than that. And so even if we cut all future emissions, we continue to add accumulative heat year over year to our Earth system. Yeah. But everyone keeps talking about net zero and refuses to acknowledge that that actually won't solve the problem. We could see a world of increasing temperatures even when you hit net zero. Yeah, uh, you know we. I'd be astonished if we don't go above 450. Yeah. Right. Because we're going to go above 450 within a decade or two. Okay. So all you have to have to do is look at the world. Where were we last at 450? Where was the temperature? Now there's one caveat. The continents have to be more or less in the same place. Because when the continents drift around, you know, that changes the climate dynamic. But you don't, you know, but at 450, the continents. If you go back, you know, a couple million years, they were in the same place. Yeah. And we're in a very bad place in temperature. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the quote equilibrium temperature is, is 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 not two degrees higher. It's higher. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so so history in the, I use history as a reasonable predictor. Yeah. <laughs> That's a fair scientific uh, principle that you're. <laughs> Your if if here. the other boundary conditions are more or less the same, that's the one caveat, yeah. like the continents are in the same place. So, and so we're in a very bad place, uh, even at 450. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, uh, any last, uh, I always like to actually end on a positive note. So any last positive comments for, uh, well, the, uh, look, for wrap up? <laughs> uh, the best, the best positive comment is a lot of young people no, there's a problem and there's a lot of brain power. Yeah. And, and so you harness this and, and the, this is something, you know, it's not a cold war race. It's not a, a, a who gets first to the moon because everybody wins. Yeah. And so, so you, one has to appreciate this is something there. If you solve these problems, there will be no losers. Well, there might be some stranded asset losers, but <laughs> but I mean, in, in terms of society and humanity, you know, it's it's going to be all good. And and so, talking about one of the most noble things you can do and think about and use whatever talents people have is this one. This is the big gorilla in the room. Yeah. Well. Dr. Stephen Chu, thank you so much for your time, sharing your story and wisdom and insight with us. And I hope you know this is the future of, uh, of great things to come. All right, thank you. Thank you. Our leadership in science and industry, our hopes for peace and security, our obligations to ourselves as well as others, all require us to make this effort to solve these mysteries, to solve them for the good of all men and for the progress of all people.